It's the end of the year and a time traditionally filled with holiday activities, looking back over the previous year and looking forward to the upcoming year. So today we're going to follow tradition and take a look back at the year's top 10 most downloaded episodes. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, you can do so for less than the cost of a cup of coffee or a meal at your favorite fast food place. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Over the past year, we've had some amazing conversations with a variety of highly talented and passionate people. I am very grateful to them for sharing their enthusiasm and knowledge with us. What was your favorite episode of the year and why? You can let us know in the comments section of this episode's webpage. For today's episode, I'm going to quickly review the 10 most popular episodes that were published between Thanksgiving 2021 and Thanksgiving 2022. Links to each of these episodes will be in the show notes. Number 10 was five late summer blooming native plants that I love. Late summer is often thought of as a challenging time for gardening. It's hot, it's humid, we may or may not be getting regular rainfall, and there are often lots of other summertime activities competing for our attention. But if our goal is to plant for pollinators and wildlife, then it is important to make sure we have plenty of plants blooming at this time of year too. That's why in this episode, I shared some of the native plants that I love and why I love them, so that you can decide if they are right for you. All of our plants in this episode bloom in the July and August timeframe, attract lots of pollinators, and have a large native range that includes Kentucky. I left it up to you to look up whether the plant is native specifically to where you live. Number nine, light pollution and its impacts on birds and other wildlife. Once upon a time, the moon was the brightest object in the night sky, followed by the stars. However, that's no longer the case. Today, the night sky is so brightly lit by artificial light sources that the majority of people living in North America can no longer see the Milky Way from their yards. Even for those of us who can see the Milky Way, it is often greatly dimmed by nearby artificial light sources or sky glow caused by the closest city or town. That's an observation that is much more important than it is often given credit for. All of that extra light that is obscuring the stars is called light pollution and it has significant impacts on a wide variety of wildlife species and can even affect us. In this episode, we were joined by Murray Burgess. Murray is an ornithologist, urban ecologist, and children's author. She is also working on her PhD at North Carolina State University, where she is studying the effects of light pollution on barn swallows. Our conversation discusses the impacts of light pollution, her research, ways we can minimize light pollution, and much more. Number eight, getting the community involved in creating pollinator habitat. In this episode, I was joined by Rebecca Ness to address an answer to the common comment of, I wish more people in my community would plant pollinator gardens, and to the common question of, what can I do to get my community involved and to make my community more pollinator friendly? Rebecca is the Vice Chair of the Environmental Sustainability Advisory Council in Bexley, Ohio. She is also the Chair of Love Your Alley, which is a local program that encourages community involvement in creating pollinator habitat. Our conversation focused on how Love Your Alley was started, some of the program's successes and challenges, lessons she learned along the way, and how others can create similar programs in their own communities. Number seven, grasslands and grassland birds of the Eastern US. Grassland birds such as bobwhite quail, 
meadowlarks, sparrows, northern harriers, burrowing owls, and many others, represent one of our fastest declining groups of birds. In many ways, this makes sense, since grasslands are some of our fastest declining ecosystems, especially in the eastern U.S. Yet, many people don't realize how rapidly grassland birds and the grassland ecosystems they depend on are disappearing. Jeremy French joined me for this episode to talk about grasslands and grassland birds. Jeremy is the Interior Low Plateau Ecoregion Coordinator for Quell Forever and the Southeastern Grasslands Institute. Our conversation includes the need for a greater awareness of just how common grasslands once were in the East. We also talk about grassland-dependent birds and their population trends, and actions that we can take on our own properties, plus much, much more. Number six, planting for pollinators. One of the most common questions I get is, what should I plant for pollinators? In fact, that's probably the most common question asked of anyone who promotes pollinator gardening. Unfortunately, there isn't a simple answer to that question because lots of different factors go into determining the best plants for any given area or situation. However, research into this topic can give us clues as to what plants might be good ones to consider for our own gardens. Dr. Laura Russo joins me for this episode. Laura is an assistant professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee. She and her colleagues are studying interactions between native plants and flower-visiting insects. And they recently published a report evaluating pollinator preferences of 18 different native plants and garden settings. Some of the topics covered in our conversation include the findings of the study, some of the complexities that go into conducting scientific research like this, why they chose the plants they did, and the importance of taking gardeners' preferences into design considerations. Okay, now I have to stop and make a comment about the next three episodes in this list. Numbers three, four, and five were essentially a three-way tie. There were only nine downloads separating numbers three and number five. I'm listing them in the order that they were on the day that I looked at the stats. But I have no doubt that if I had looked at the numbers on a different day, or perhaps even at a different time on the same day, that they could very easily have been in a different order. Number five, ask a bumblebee, what flowers do bumblebees prefer? It's easy to find general advice about the types of flowers to plant for bees, because we have a good idea of what types of flowers tend to be attractive to bees in general. However, not all bees are the same, and the details can vary, which is also part of what we discussed in the episode sitting in the number four slot of this list, but more on that later. Basically, what it comes down to is that we still have a lot to learn about the specifics, such as knowing exactly what types of flowers certain species of bees prefer or what we can plant if we want to concentrate on attracting specific types of bees. This is especially true when it comes to our native bees. Ask a Bumblebee is a new community science or citizen science project that is striving to answer some of those questions specifically for bumblebees. Janan el is the project coordinator for Ask a Bumblebee. She joined us in this episode to talk about the project the types of questions it hopes to answer, and how people can help out by observing bumblebees on flowers. Along the way, we also shared some of our own stories and experiences. Number four, are larger patch sizes better when planting for pollinators? When it comes to planting for pollinators or gardening for pollinators, the traditional advice has always been to plant larger patch sizes or clumps of plants. The thought is that the larger patch sizes will be easier to see and more attractive to pollinators than smaller clumps or patch sizes. But saying that assumes that 
all pollinators are attracted to the same thing and that they respond to different species of plants in the same way. In this episode, I was joined by Tristan Barley. Tristan recently received his master's degree from Miami University in Ohio and is currently a PhD student in entomology at the University of Illinois. The research that Tristan conducted for his master's thesis questioned the traditional advice and found that the real answer to the title question isn't as simple as the answer that is often given. This was a very interesting conversation that discussed his research, his findings, and how we can apply those findings in our own gardens and landscapes. Number three, a conversation with Kyle Liebarger from the Native Habitat Project. We recorded this conversation early in 2022, and then I had the pleasure of meeting Kyle in person at a conference we both attended in the fall. If you are interested in grassland and native habitat restoration, especially in Alabama and other areas of the South, then Kyle is someone you want to check out. He is passionate about raising awareness of native plants and grassland communities, and he's actively involved in multiple on-the-ground conservation and restoration projects. Our conversation for this episode was very informal and covered a wide range of topics. A few of the topics we discussed included how less than 1% of our native grasslands remain, how private landowners can make a huge difference in preserving and restoring grassland ecosystems in the East, and how just because a plant is normal to us because we see it every day, doesn't mean that it couldn't actually be something really rare or special. Number two, attracting ruby-throated hummingbirds to your yard. When people think about attracting hummingbirds to their yards, the most common reaction is to put up a hummingbird feeder. However, making your yard more attractive to hummingbirds goes way beyond just putting up a feeder. This was a fun episode with Cindy Routledge, who is the CEO of Southeastern Avian Research, or SCAR, SEER. She is so passionate and knowledgeable about hummingbirds, and that really showed through in this conversation. We talked about hummingbird diets, what makes good habitat for hummingbirds, how we can make our yards more attractive to hummingbirds, cleaning and maintaining hummingbird feeders, hummingbird adaptations for cold weather, and much more. If you love hummingbirds and enjoy watching them visit your yard, then this is an episode that you don't want to miss. Number one, gardening with native plants. I am very happy and excited about the fact that over the last several decades, interest in gardening with native plants has been growing steadily. Growing native plants in our gardens and landscapes can have many benefits, both for us as the gardeners and for the pollinators and wildlife that also call our yards home. Plus, we have some absolutely gorgeous native plants that deserve to be recognized in their own right. Jennifer Seska joined me in this episode for an enthusiastic and informal conversation about gardening with native plants. Jennifer is a conservation coordinator with the State Botanical Garden of Georgia at the University of Georgia, Athens. She and her colleagues are doing some amazing work and I am grateful for their efforts to help others learn about and grow native plants. A few of the topics we talk about include our own curiosity and love of learning, the importance of growing regionally appropriate native plants, something I was recently surprised to learn about common milkweed, some of our favorite native species for smaller areas, and how cues to care can make a huge difference and how our native gardens are perceived. Those are the top 10 episodes based on number of downloads through a traditional podcast listening app. However, some people don't like listening to podcasts that way. Instead, they prefer listening to the episodes on YouTube, but YouTube views are counted separately from podcast downloads. So I also have a bonus episode for you based on YouTube views. Now, the most commonly viewed episode on the Backyard Ecology podcast YouTube channel was the conversation with Kyle Liebarger, which doesn't really count as a bonus 
because we've already talked about it. However, this second most commonly viewed episode on YouTube didn't make our top 10 list by downloads. So that episode counts as a bonus in my book and was a glimpse into the fascinating world of cedar glades. Glades are ecosystems where the soils are really shallow and rocky, often with patches of rock showing on the surface. They can be found all over the world, including multiple states within the eastern U.S. These ecosystems are unique areas that support some really interesting and sometimes highly specialized or rare organisms. In this episode, I was joined by Dr. Kim Clary Sandler. Kim is a professor of biology education at Middle Tennessee State University and co-director of the Center for the Cedar Glade Studies. Some of the topics we discussed included characteristics of glades, some of the different types of organisms you can find there, ways homeowners can deal with glades on their properties, and much more. We also shared numerous stories related to our own experiences with glades. Oh, and just as a side note, since I mentioned YouTube, there are two Backyard Ecology channels on YouTube. One is the Backyard Ecology podcast channel, and the other is the Backyard Ecology channel, where Anthony and I share videos. They are both us. They just serve different purposes and have different types of content. I hope you enjoyed that review of the most popular episodes published between Thanksgiving 2021 and Thanksgiving 2022. Please help Backyard Ecology continue to grow by telling others about the Backyard Ecology blog, podcast, and YouTube channel. I wish you and yours the happiest of holiday seasons. And until next time, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.